Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So a reading from Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 4, entitled the Creation of the Fourth Order. Uh, chapter 6, Brahma satisfies Lord Shiva. I'm on text 49. So is everybody ready? Almost. 4, 6, 49. Pavams to Pumsa Padamasya Maya Taranta Yas Prishta Matisa Mustadrik Tayahatam Maswanu Karma Chaitas 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 What is it? Chaitasva, okay. Chaitasva. Anugraham kartum ihar hasi prabhu. Bhavangs tupum sa paramasya maya. Tarantya spishta matisa masta drig. Vaya hatat maswanu karma chaitaswa. Anugraham kartumahar hasi prabhu. Vavangs tupum sa paramasya maya. Durantya sprishta mati samasta drig. Durantya sprishta mati Anugraham kartu mahar hasi prabhu. Is that, is that, do you think you could get that chair and bring it to her? Yeah, I 
Word by word. Balan, your lordship. To, but, pumsaha, of the person. Paramasya, the supreme. Mayaya, by the material energy. Tarantaya, of great potency. Asprishta, unaffected. Matihi, intelligence. Samastadrik, seer or knower of everything. Saya, by the same illusory energy. Hata Atmasu, bewildered at heart. Anu Karma Chetasu, whose hearts are attracted by fruit of activities. Anu Graham, mercy. Kartum, to do. Iha, in this case. The heart, Arhasi, desire. Prabhu, O Lord. Translation into English <laughs> for us. My dear Lord, you are never bewildered by the formidable, formidable influence of the leisure energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, you are omniscient and should be merciful and compassionate towards those who are bewildered by the same illusory energy and are very much attached to fruit of activities. Purport. A Vaishnav is never bewildered by the influence of the external energy because he is engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. The Lord states in Bhagavad Gita 7.14, Daivi Hesha Gunamai Mama Maya Dratiya my divine energy consisting of the three modes of material nature is difficult to overcome, but those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. A Vaishnav should take care of those who are bewildered by this maya instead of becoming angry with them. Because without a Vaishnav's mercy, they have no way to get out of the clutches of maya. Those who have been condemned by Maya are rescued by the mercy of the devotees. Vancha kalpadribishcha kripa sindhubhivacha patitanam pavanebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. They are just like desire trees who can fulfill, fulfill the desires of everyone, and they are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. Those who are under the influence of the illusory energy are attracted attracted to fruit of activities, but a Vaishnav preacher attracts their hearts to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Om Igani Tabarandasya, Vinayam Juna Shalakya, Chakshur, Malita Mina, Tasma Shri Gurveda Maha, Mukam Karidvacha, Lam Pungam Mangal Tegirin, Yakibata Mahamande, Shri Guru Nditanam, Vancha Kapit Vishta, Kriba Sindhavacha, Patitanam Pavnibyo, Vaishnava Vyodamanaha, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Dvaita Gadadha Shivasati Gauda Bhaktivinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So do you two know each other? Oh, same class. Okay, at San Diego State, right? All right. Um, so this particular verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, or the Bhagavat Purana, and specifically the purport, or the commentary on this verse, it is um, explaining the glories of a Vaishnav. So Vaishnav is referring to a servant or devotee of Vishnu or devotee of Krishna. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So servant of God. Pure servant of God. Um, in that the devotees or the servants of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they are uh, full of compassion. They are full of mercy. And specifically they're full of compassion and full of mercy uh, for those 
of souls who have forgotten um, their their spiritual uh, their spiritual uh, identity, yeah, their spiritual identity, their spiritual life. In other words, the souls that are within this world um, completely absorbed in illusion, or to some degree absorbed in illusion, which illusions means forgetting uh, God, forgetting Krishna. Um, so in relation to uh, this uh, Vaishnavas, they, they have a saying that says, uh, charity starts at home. <laughs> so uh, one time our, our spiritual teacher, uh, Srila Prabhupada, he, devotees, they, you know, they would go out and they would chant at the park. They'd, you know, how we, how we do Harinam with musical instruments and chanting. So then, uh, Bhajanarayan Swami tells us, he said, devotees, they'd pack a lunch, you know, whatever it was, bread and have different preparations, vegetables. And then there'd be people at the park, um, just a bunch of random people at the park. So, so then all the devotees, they, what they would do is they start giving people their lunch, you know. <laughs> and then they wouldn't have any lunch. The devotees wouldn't have any lunch. So then Prabhupada heard about this, and he said, "You could you could make some extra and bring it to the park, but don't give away your own lunch." You know. And the point was, and Prabhupada said, "Charity starts at home." So, so us, uh, those who are members of the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, they, um, they have to keep this in mind that charity starts at home. In, 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 two, in two ways I'm referring to, in the sense that if we want to give mercy, if we want to give knowledge, if we want to give Krishna Consciousness to others, we have to have it. We have to have it in the first place. In other words, we have to have that enthusiasm. As uh, Prabhupada's spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, those who have life, they can preach or they can teach. They can spread the message of Krishna. And those who don't have life, they can't. Means life means enthusiasm. So, in order to give Krishna crutches, we have to have that, we have to have mercy or the grace of Krishna. And, um, and specifically, uh, we have to take it. We have to accept that mercy. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, he had a, uh, a disciple named Vishnu John, which I'm sure most are familiar with. So Vishnu John Swami, he, uh, Prabhupada made a comment about him. He said, Srila Prabhupada said as the guru, he said, I'm giving my mercy freely, you know, the, the grace of the guru. He's given his blessings freely, spiritual blessings. And then Srila Prabhupada said, but Vishnu John, he's taken advantage. You know, he's taken advantage. So uh, it's, it's, it's there, the, the mercy, the grace, uh, what we need is there. But we have to take it. Um, and therefore, Srila Prabhupada would advise devotees to have a very strong uh, morning, um, morning program which they chant Hare Krishna, they read the books, they, they meditate, and they, they do th things um, that will give them strength, the spiritual strength. Um, so that, in that way we have to, you know, charity starts at home. means in, in order for us to make a difference in the world, we first have to uh, change ourselves. Or like one, like Kevin, I don't know, he's quoting somebody, at I don't know who it was. If you want to change the world, you know, clean your room. First, start with your room. You know. Have a nice clean room. And so in other words, yeah, we have to work on ourselves if we want to change the world in a positive way. Um, and also, charity start, uh, starts at home. Me in another way, it means um, if we want to be compassionate and, and kind and and helpful to, to people who are, are bereft of Krishna consciousness or God consciousness, but we, we first have to be kind to each other, to each other. means to people within uh, the temple, within the, within the International Society of Krishna consciousness, our friends, you know, within the circle of devotees. Um, so, 
in the early days in Boston, Srila Prabhupada established a temple there. And, uh, you know, a bunch of devotees were joining. They're becoming monks. You know, young women and men were becoming monks and nuns. and Right, nuns. <laughs> and uh, there was one man who joined the temple, but he was very a difficult case. You know, sometimes, like, we're, we're monks here, you know, all the guys in the orange. and So we're, we're monks, and, you know, we live in a temple. So we have a bunch of, sometimes we have other men who want to join and become monks as well. You know, but it's a whole different lifestyle and the training, and, you know, sometimes it's difficult, especially with new people. You're done with new people, and it's challenging. So there was this young man who joined, and he was a very challenging person. Uh, yeah, very challenging person. In the sense that what he would do is, in the lobby, he would like set up his uh, himself in the lobby. So he would have all his books there, and he'd have his whatever, like a blanket there, and you know, sometimes he'd be reading, sometimes he'd take a little nap, you know, whatever. He was a little eccentric, so he's in the lobby. You can imagine if someone was in the San Diego lobby, you know, monk, he was just kind of there, posted up. Or in L.A., you can imagine that, you know, wherever. So devotees were having a hard time with him. Very eccentric person. and Nice, but eccentric and difficult. They used to call him, actually, Crazy Peter. So devotees were having a difficult time, so they, they, uh, they wrote a letter to Srila Prabhupada, to this, you know, the, f the leader. And they said, we're having a difficult time with, uh, you know, Bhakta Peter, and you know, what should we do? In essence, that's what they said. Satsrup Das Goswami was there. Other devotees were there. So then, um, Srila Prabhupada responded. He said, he said so many things, but the main line that really caught devotees' eyes was, what's the matter? Can't you tolerate? So Srila Prabhupada was saying, just tolerate him there. Just tolerate him. Let him, you know. So then... Uh, my spiritual teacher, uh, his own is Giraj Swami, he was there in Boston, and then he left to India. So he stayed there for so many years. And actually, he didn't visit the United States, at least L.A., he didn't visit for another 30 years after that. Interesting enough. So, so time passed, and you know he knew about Crazy Peter. He was there when he left, and then he went to India. So then years and years and years passed. So then, so then Giraj Swami, he went to L.A., for the L.A. Rathayatra. So he was in the temple room, and he was during the, t you know, singing songs in the morning, Tulsi, the Tulsi song. So he's, so he's standing there, and then all of a sudden he he looks and he goes, oh, who's that person there? You know, he goes, is that? Cr he's thinking to himself, is that is that crazy, Peter? This is thirty years later, and then he asked another uh, he asked another devotee, he said, who is that person? And he was, you know, as a monk and crazy Peter. He said, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's um, Krushakrata Prabhu. And then uh, Giraj Swami said, oh, Krushakrata Prabhu? You mean the, the one who's been translating all the ancient uh, spiritual texts into, from Sanskrit into English and, you know, nourishing the whole movement worldwide, you know, translating so many wonderful literatures, spiritual literatures? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's him, Krushakrata. And then that was Crazy Peter. So Crazy Peter became Krushakrata Prabhu, who was translated so many books, Sanskrit books, and you know, so many inspiring books of our previous teachers. So, um, so the point is that Srila Prabhupada, he said, just tolerate. Now, he could have said, oh, just tell him to go. You know, and then, then maybe he wouldn't have become Krushakrata. Maybe he would have, whatever, done something else with his life and his time. But Srila Prabhupada said, just tolerate him. And then he became such a great asset to the Krishna Conscious Movement. Such a great devotee. Did so much wonderful service. So that's an example of uh, charity starts at home means, uh, yeah, we have to be tolerant and merciful, but also with, with our fellow, uh, with our fellow, you know, our cl the people close to us. Um, and then there's a sto there's also a story of this person. Um, it's called uh, Murgari. He was a hunter. Um, so 
what he used to do, this was for his livelihood, he would hunt. Whatever, for food. Or I don't know if he would sell the products afterwards. I don't know what he was doing, but somehow that he would maintain himself like that. So he was, um, what he would do, he would see the animals, whatever they were, deer or this or that, and he, with his bow and his arrow, he would shoot them. But he would shoot them in such a way that uh, they, they wouldn't die or he wouldn't complete the task. He would let them, um, what is it? What is it? Yeah, let them suffer. You know, he wouldn't you know, put them out of their misery. He would shoot them and half kill them. So then one day a great uh, sage, a great personality, Narada Muni, he came by and he told him, he said, you are half killing these animals and uh, this is not good. It's not good to kill animals at all. You know, you should give up your hunting business, you know, break your bow. And, uh, and then the hunter said, but this is how I maintain myself. And then Narada Muni said, this is not good. You can have, you know, bad karma. He was preaching to him like that. And then eventually, uh, Mergar was starting to see the light. And then Narada Muni said, well, you should just break your bow. Just break your bow and give up this business that you're engaging in and chant uh, the names of God, chant Hare Krishna. So then um, that's what he did, Magrai. You know, Narada Muni had this power to influence people positively in Krishna consciousness. So then um, he did that. And then, and then Narada Muni, he visited some time later. And he saw that this this Mergari, who was previously a cruel hunter, when, when Narada Muni was arriving, uh, uh, Mergari, the previous hunter, what he did is he, he took like a piece of cloth, like a chatter, and then he was, he was uh, sweeping the pathway. And why is that? He had to get the ants out of the way. So in other words, he didn't want to step on the ants. <laughs> or he didn't want Narada Muni accidentally to step on the ants. So, from a hunter who would half kill animals, and he, he, t he, he uh, actually enjoyed it, to a person, and he didn't have a problem with it. It wasn't like, a, you know, oh, I hate doing this, I have to do this. He actually he had no problem with it. From that position to the position of he doesn't even want to hurt an ant. So that's quite a difference. So these two examples are brought up um, to illustrate that you know, there's Murgari, there was Crazy Peter. So these these people, on, on some level, at least in the eyes of some people, they would be considered hopeless cases. Cases that, you know, you should just, just this person's just a hopeless case, just don't even spend any energy on them. But because these two great personalities, Narada Muni, great sage, and Srila Prabhupada, were very compassionate and merciful to these personalities, they, these personalities became great personalities, who were not hopeless cases, but were cases that, uh, but were cases of inspiration, examples of inspiration for us. So, um, so that's the idea that we want to, those of us who are trying to broadcast uh, Krishna consciousness or the message of Krishna, the spiritual message of Krishna, they have to be, um, you know, tolerant and merciful, kind to people, give them a chance. Um, and in that way, uh, the yeah, that way things will actually go on. And by definition, it says Krishna, he's a, it says Krishna, he's a, hey Krishna, Kruna, Sindhu, he, he's an ocean of mercy. So God's an ocean of mercy. So, and what does that mean? That means there's many interesting things about an ocean, but one of the interesting things about an ocean is that uh, you cannot measure the content of the ocean. No one's done that yet. I don't think they're going to do it. So there's so much there. So similarly, uh, you cannot measure the content of mercy or kindness, the kindness, forgiveness, tolerance of, of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But also, those who are who are deeply connected, those who are deeply close to Krishna, they're also like that, an ocean of mercy. So we have Srila Prabhupada, we sing every day, right? Sri Guru Karuna Sindhu, Karuna Sindhu, ocean of mercy, the Guru is an ocean of mercy. So all of us, we may not be oceans of mercy just yet, 
But we are also meant to be uh, spiritual masters, gurus. We're also supposed to be oceans of mercy. And that our, our kindness, our forgiveness, our tolerance is unlimited. You know, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't break. It's unconditional. Um, so a nice example we have of this is uh, Prahlad Maharaj within the Bhagavatam. So Prahlad Maharaj, um, there's a nice verse here. I'll read. Srila Prabhupada actually, one devotee asked him um, about his mood. And um, he said, it seems that you're in the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. And then, is that true? So this was Hari Krish Das. Uh, he asked him if he was in the mood of Prahlad. And, and then Prabhupada said, yes, I'm in the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. And he said, I'm always trying to bring people to Krishna. Save people. Um, you could find that in, I don't know if the book is still, I don't know if you have that book in Los Angeles. It's the book, uh, All Glories to the Sankatan Devotees. You have that book? You have that book. Huh? It's a good book, actually. Haikesh Swami at the time, he uh, compiled that book. and It was actually very wonderful and but it, within that book, he says that there's that exchange there. He gives that exchange to him and Prabhupada. So if we want to know the mood of Srila Prabhupada, it's the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. And if we want to know the mood of Prahlad Maharaj, it's very, cl it's very clearly described in the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So if we study the teachings of Prahlad, we'll know the, teach we'll know the mood of Prabhupada. So there's one particular verse which is alluding to this that I'll read. Um, He's praying to Nrsingadev, form of the Lord. He says, My dear Lord Nrsingadev, I see that there are many saintly persons indeed, but they are interested only in their own deliverance or salvation. Not caring for the big cities and towns, they go to the Himalayas or, or the forest to meditate with vows of silence. So he's saying that there's many great monks and sages and saintly people, but they want to run off into the hills of the mountains and the Himalayas. And why is that? Because the cities and towns are disturbances for spiritually minded people. You know, a bunch of materialism going on and it's a disturbance. Did any of you think about going to the Himalayas? One, two, three, whoa, four, whoa. What about you, Ryan? You ever thought about it? Another place. Another place, another distant place. So one, two, three, four, five. Whoa. Anybody else? You too? Six? What about you? Did you ever think about going to the out in the mountains and the Himalayas and living there? No. Okay. Yeah, so it might be a common thing because it's just you know, the cities, it's a lot of you know, anxiety and a lot of things going on, passion and just disturbance. It's a disturbed place, actually. Um, so people have that idea, yeah, I'll go off to a nice, quiet location. And my sister's like that, you know, she mo that's why she moved up to Oregon. You know, very peaceful and kind of small town. And so. so this is the idea that's saying here that they want to go off to the Himalayas. The saintly people. They're, n they're not interested in delivering others as or helping others. As for me, however, I do not wish to be liberated alone, leaving aside all these poor fools and rascals. I know that without Krishna consciousness, without taking shelter of your lotus feet, one cannot be happy. Therefore, I wish to bring them back to the shelter at your lotus feet. Purport. This is the decision of the Vaishnava, the pure devotee of the Lord. For himself, he has no problems. For a spiritually minded person, they don't have any problems. The problems are solved. They don't have uh, anxiety problems. You know, they're happy, they're satisfied, they don't have any problems. Even if, he, even if he has to stay in this material world because his own only business is to remain in Krishna consciousness, the Krishna conscious person can go even to hell and still be happy. So in other words, they could be anywhere in any situation, heavenly situation, hellish situation, and they'll still be happy because, uh, because spiritual happiness doesn't depend on where you are or who you are or anything like that, anything material. 
Therefore, Prahlad Maharaj said, Nai do duje para duraptya vitar uh, vaitaranya. O oh, best of the great personalities, I am not at all afraid of material existence. The pure devotee is never unhappy in any condition of life. How does that sound? Sound good? Never unhappy? This is confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam, Narayana Prasarve. For a devotee being situated in the heavenly planets and being in the hellish planets are equal, for a devotee lives neither in heaven nor in hell, but with Krishna in the spiritual world. So they're living on a whole different plane. Um, it says, when it says he to, um, it's referring to she. This is our, anyways, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a way that people used to write. And our spiritual teacher, he's from a different, you know, many, many years ago. He was educated in a particular way he would write like this he, but it's also referring to she. So it's not, not just for men. He is not interested in so-called meditation in the Himalayas or the forest. Rather, his interest is in the busiest part of the world. San Diego is one of the top, I think, definitely one of the top ten biggest cities in America. There's Houston and New York and L.A. L.A., I think, is number two, you yeah. know. So, um, where he teaches people Krishna consciousness. So they stay within the cities, L.A., San Diego, New York, Houston, all these different places. Why? Uh, to teach people uh, Krishna consciousness, to p teach people the spiritual principles they can live by to become happy. That's why we have the temple here. Or else we would just pack up and, you know, go to a quiet place. <laughs> The Krishna conscious movement was started for this purpose. We do not teach one to meditate in a secluded place just so that one may show that he has become very much advanced and may be proud of his so-called transcendental meditation, although he engages in all sorts of foolish materialistic activity. A Vaishnava like Prahlad Maharaj is not interested in such a bluff of spiritual advancement. So there's like cheaters, the cheaters, whatever. Uh, you know, they dress up and you know, they meditate in a secluded place, especially within India, and people become very impressed. Oh, he's such a, you know, such a great personality, and you know, they come and give donations and stuff like that. But Srila Prabhupada's saying we're not concerned with that. Um, rather, he is interested in enlightened people in Krishna consciousness because that is the only way for them to become happy. Prahlad Maharaj says, I know that without Krishna consciousness, without taking shelter of your lotus feet, one cannot be happy. One wanders within the universe, life after life, by the, but by the grace of a devotee, a servant of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, one can get the clue of Krishna consciousness and then not only be, become happy in this world, but also return home back to Godhead. So this is the principle of reincarnation, that we as souls, as pure spirit souls, we are encaged within this material body that we're all in. We all have different bodies, obviously. But each soul is individual, and we're encaged in this particular body. And at the time of death, the soul is set free, temporarily. But according to the principle of reincarnation, the soul goes into another body. Um, and, uh, and that body could be different bodies. There's, you know, we take different forms, different places in the world, even different planets. Um, so the idea is that uh, this process of reincarnation, uh, we want to stop it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. <laughs> we want to stop it because, um, and the reason being is because there are so many difficulties uh, within this world. I mean, that's one of the reasons. But there's so many difficulties within this world. So much suffering. So we, we just see it. Just look at the news, you know, or look within our own lives sometimes. So the idea is that this isn't our natural state of being uh, encaged within these material bodies. But the idea is that we break the cycle of reincarnation. And as, it's, as he states here, we could go back home, back to Godhead. So what is that, say, what is that referring to? That, that means there's a whole other transcendental world in which there are personalities there who have forms, but they're spiritual forms. And what is a spiritual form means? It means it's full of bliss, full of knowledge. There's no, there's no problems, you know, within the spiritual world. And specifically, and most importantly, you're there with Krishna and all of his loving associates, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
So that's the idea that he's saying here. And that happens by the grace or coming in contact with those who are informed about this. Because you can't really you can't really get involved with something unless you're informed about it. <laughs> it just you know, it doesn't work. If someone has to inform you, whatever it may be. So that's what he's saying here. Um, that is the real target in life. The members of the Krishna Conscious Movement are not at all interested in so-called meditation in the Himalayas or the forest. If we want, we can take a little visit there sometimes, though. <laughs> Vrindavan Forest, you know, you go to Vrindavan and Kartik or something. You know. Like a retreat, you know, but not to... Anyways, whatever. Where one will only make a show of meditation, ne nor are they interested in opening many schools for, for yoga and meditation in the cities. Rather, every member of the Krishna Conscious Movement is interested in going door to door to try to convince people about the teaching of Bhagavad Gita as it is, the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. That is the purpose of the Hare Krishna Movement. Okay, that's the purpose. It's the purpose of the Hare Krishna Movement, to convince people. The members of the Krishna Conscious Movement must be fully convinced that without Krishna, one cannot be happy. Thus, the Krishna Conscious Person avoids all kinds of pseudo-spiritualists, transcendentalists, meditators, monists, philosophers and phil philanthropists. So he's, so what he's saying is that we, I mean it's clear what he's saying but I'm just adding to it, but um, that the idea is that um, that the devotee has the experience that without Krishna one cannot be happy. Without developing a loving relationship with God, with Krishna, the Supreme Person of God, one cannot be happy. So then someone may say, oh, well, well, how do they know that? <laughs> well, how do we know anything? But one, one way in which we have some faith in something, whatever we think we know or whatever we really know, is that by our experience. So there's been many, I know many people throughout the world who have given up um, a lot of material you could say material ambitions. In other words, giving up being, they have given up the idea of being successful materially. But they were, they're not it's, not, it's not that they had no other option, they just, in other words, they're very intelligent people, but they just gave up uh, trying to be materially successful, you know, make a lot of money and all that. And why is that? Because um, they have engaged in spiritual life, uh, like, for example, they become a monk or something and dedicate their whole time and energy to, s to spiritual uh, understanding and helping people on the spiritual platform. So, now, of course, someone c can, you know, have a lot of money and all that, but, but the, p my, the point I'm making is that, I, I mean, I myself, I, you know, I've been in the temple here, Hare Krishna Temple, as a monk for the last 12 years of my life, since I was 18 years old, and I'm 30. And I could have went down the road of material success. I, you know, <laughs> I have a brain and it works and I could have done many things. But I chose not to because I felt that and experienced that what I, what I experienced in Krishna consciousness in this uh, particular practice was way more satisfying, um, spiritually satisfying. So, um, so yeah, by experience, we 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 will learn and we'll understand uh, particular things about this world and ourselves. So that's what's being said here that that the devotee is convinced a lot due to experience that without Krishna one cannot be happy. So um, so people should try to give this idea a chance that okay, well maybe I'm happy now, maybe I'm not happy, but whatever the case is maybe I could be a lot happier. And therefore there's this Krishna option that we, that we could take, that maybe I'll, I could become a lot happier. And I always thought it was a foolish, unintelligent uh, notion that, oh, I'm happy. And, you know, so you talk to people, oh, I'm completely happy, I'm completely satisfied. And well, I mean, what about, can't you be more happier? No. Like is there is that like it? Like you reach the you reach the perfection of your life at this when you're 22 years old, you know, living in Southern California, 
I mean, I also grew up here in San Diego, but I'm just saying it's like, isn't there something more? So, so that's how I always thought that, okay, I, I had everything, you know, a Southern California boy <laughs> may want. But I was thinking, there must be something more. Though. I, like, have I reached the, the pinnacle of success, the perfection? I don't think so. There must be some more happiness out there. So anyways, this is what is being stated here, that there is, and that's in relation to developing our loving relationship with Krishna. So anyways, does anyone uh, have any comments or questions? It's a mixed audience, so it's <laughs> so it was hard to navigate because you know I mean? I have some monks here who have been practicing for many years, and then maybe other people who may not be so familiar. <laughs> so I was a little trying to balance the points here. So, Yes, Zach. Yes, that's true. Are you happy in any situation? <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, Prabhupada tells that story. Well, you know, through the years, I haven't really. For some reason, I've really told that story so much. Although I've heard it, but over the years, I've really told that story so much. But what is there? There's a prince, there's a butcher, there's a brahmachari, and a devotee. So it seems like you, you, you remember that one? Yeah, he used to say that story. You want to give us the brief? Yeah. die and go to the spiritual world. May you live or not die. Okay. It doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? You might, you might write a book <laughs> in the future. Anyways, it's good. No, it's good. Hey, we say that we're happier, but yeah, I mean, we say that we're happy, but we could be happier. That's true. We, we agree with that, in the sense that, because because he is bringing up the point that I'm saying that you talk with someone, they say I'm I'm happy, and then that's that's kind of it. They're like, you know, that's it. You know, I, I've you know, I, I have whatever I have. A, 
I have a nice relationship, you know, a boyfriend or girlfriend, I got a nice house or apartment, I got a nice car, I got a wonderful education, and whatever, whatever people's idea of happiness is. So I say, but can't you be happy? And they say, no, no, I'm happy. So then he's bringing up the point, well, couldn't people just say that to me, for example, oh, but can't you be happier? I'm happy, but can I be happier? And I say, yes, I can, <laughs> I can be happier. <laughs> so that's the thing about spiritual, um, that's the thing about spiritual life, is that one can be happier. It, it, and it's said to be unlimited. So in other words, our happiness, you know, we're, we're happy, but we become un happier and happier and happier unlimitedly. That's the idea. So there's no limit to our happiness, developing our happiness on the, on the, on the spiritual side. And on the material side, you know, there, there's, there's a limit to the experiences. Like, you know, one may go to the local, they call it, not pizza parlor, parlor they, they call it pizza parlor, ice cream parlor. One goes to the local ice cream shop, Baskin Robbins, there's 31 flavors, and you may be able to eat one, two, three, four, ten, that's a lot, but however many you could have. But at a particular point, you don't want to see that ice cream anymore. That's like the last thing you want to see. You become sick, actually, of, of uh, it, um, by s even by seeing it or smelling it, you just don't want it anymore. And whatever the material ha the material enjoyment may be, on any level, physical level or mental level, whatever. But the spiritual uh, but spiritual happiness is different in the sense that you chant you and you chant you know God's names, Krishna's names. You connect. You have that. Uh, spiritual connection with Krishna and the happiness is unlimited it just gets better and better and better or like my friend says he says he said every song I ever played it just it gets it gets tiring it gets old you know you have may have a favorite song I, mean, I had a favorite song I won't tell you what it was but <laughs> no I'm just no it's not necessary but I had this favorite song and I literally listened to it probably I don't know, hundreds of times, but I really liked it. You know, you kind of like really listen to every part of it. and But then at one point, I was like, all right, well, it's time to move on. But his point was that, because he's been doing this for decades, he says every decade, this is the only song I know that every decade, it becomes this song right here, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. It becomes sweeter and sweeter and sweeter, means more enjoyable. And I have that experience, too. Many people have that experience. It doesn't become ever fresh, you know, it doesn't become tiring. It's it's always remains uh, new, you know, exciting. You know, I've been chanting for whatever, twelve years. How many years have you been chanting? Your whole life? What are you for I don't wanna no. Yeah, thirty thirty six years, you know, he's been chanting thirty six years and so you pr you don't get tired of it, right? It's a nice song, right? <laughs> so it has a different nature. So all right, so we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Ventura, Shimon Bhagavatam, Kim, Chad.